In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. How shall it be in that fearful day and hour when the judge shall sit on his dreadful throne, the books shall be opened and the actions of men examined, the secrets of darkness made public, angels shall move quickly gathering the nations, come and see kings and princes, slaves and free, Sinners and righteous, rich and poor, for the judge has come to pass sentence on all who inhabit the earth. And who shall bear to stand before his face in the presence of the holy angels, calling us to account for our actions and thoughts, both night and by day? How shall it be then for me in that hour? But before the end is here, make haste, O my soul, crying, Turn me back and save me, O only compassionate God. This was one of the hymns we heard sung in the matin service last night as we keep the celebration and commemoration this day of the Sunday of the Last Judgment. This, the third Sunday in preparation for the feast or for the fast of Lent that prepares us to enter into the arena of salvation, the struggle against the passions, against our sins. And in the past two weeks, we've heard the beautiful parables of Christ, that of the Pharisee and the publican, and that of the prodigal son. These wonderful stories that remind us of God's rich mercy to us. If we will just repent of our sins, he will forgive us all things. He will draw us back into his fatherly embrace. He will draw us back into the household of salvation. But the Holy Father's taking care that we might not think simply of God's mercy and grace and therefore become lax in the struggle for our salvation, lay before us this day the remembrance of the second coming of Christ, of the great and final judgment which we will all face. And with this, we we end the year of the church in one sense, because next Sunday we will commemorate the expulsion of Adam and Eve from paradise. And so the whole cycle of history is laid out before us. We've come to the end, and the church, not wanting us to wait until the end, to think of the end, brings the end into our midst today. And so we hear of Christ tell of how God will sit on the throne, and all will be raised from the dead, and will be separated out to the right and to the left. And we are to be mindful of what it is that we have done in this life and how we will be judged. But what's interesting to think about is the basis upon which Christ says the judgment will be issued. It's interesting to note, he doesn't put all the people to the left and all the ones to the right and say to the ones on the right, well done, my good and faithful servants. You were the ones who always were in church every Sunday, who always kept the fast, who always said your prayers, who always did this, who always did that. Those things are not not important. Those are how we work out our salvation. But they are not our salvation in and of themselves. But how does he judge those that were there that day? He judges them on the basis of whether or not they served him, Christ, in the face of their brother around them. He says to those on the right, when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was without a house and on the streets, you gave me a room to stay in. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was sick, you comforted me. And they say, when did we see you, Lord, and do these things to you? And he says, every time you did it to the least of my brethren, you did it to me. But sadly, those on the left heard the opposite. How often they had missed the opportunity to serve Christ in the person of those around them. And therefore, had denied him the presence in their life. And therefore, when he came, he denied them the presence in the communion with God. And so what we hear then is that this act of mercy, this almsgiving, 
is so essential to our working out of our salvation. And as we said last Sunday, we were going to focus these three Sundays on the threefold cord of our salvation. Prayer, which we spoke about last week. Fasting, we will speak about next week. But this week, almsgiving. Almsgiving. Now, what do the scriptures tell us about almsgiving? First off, in the Old Testament, the practice of tithing and of giving alms were united with one another. Even before the law had been given through Moses, we see many of the great biblical patriarchs giving of tithes to God and of the, to those that were in need. The great patriarch Abraham, for example, when the foreign kings had come into the land of Canaan and had taken some of the people captive, including his nephew Lot, he rose up a small army, he went out into battle against them, and out of the spoils that he took from that battle, he took a tithe of that. He gave it to the priest Melchizedek to offer up to God Most High, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And so to his grandson Jacob, having gone and labored for decades with his father-in-law Laban, working as a herdsman, when he returned back to the land of his father Abraham and Isaac, he brought with him a great deal of wealth, and when he came to the place of Bethel, where he had had the vision of God with the angels descending and ascending on the ladder from heaven, he made a, he made a commitment to God, and he gave back to him a tenth of the wealth that God had given to him. Then in the law of Moses, we read of the tithe that was commanded of the people of Israel, and there were three portions to it. We tend to think of it as a 10%, but it was actually a third that they were to give. There was one tithe that they gave to the temple, remembering that everything that they had was really from God and so dedicated back to the Lord one-tenth of what he had given them. And with that, the temple was taken care of and the clergy that served within it. Then there was a tithe that they were to put aside to provide for themselves and their families so they could go on religious pilgrimage each year to the city of Jerusalem. Because a pious Jew was supposed to go to Jerusalem for the feasts of the Passover and for the Day of Atonement each year. And as you know, that you got to put some money aside. So it was sort of like a vacation package they were to put aside each year so that they could go to Jerusalem for that. And then a third tithe was called for every third year that they were to put aside a tithe of their, get, of their wealth to give to the widows, to the orphans, and to the sojourners, those that were without home in their land. Elsewhere in the Old Testament, God speaks of the blessings that come from those who give back to the Lord. In the book of Proverbs, we hear, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of your produce. And your barns will be filled with plenty. Your vats will burst forth with wine. Now, you might say to me, well, Father, that's the Old Testament. Haven't we put that aside? But remember, what does Christ tell us? In the Sermon on the Mount, he says, I came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. To fulfill it and to fill it out to its fullness. And so, while in the New Testament, we hear Christ at times criticizing the hypocrisy of some of the religious leaders of the Jews of his time, who thought that as long as they kept the externals of the Old Testament law, they were okay, while never plumbing the depths to really understand the intention that lay behind each and every one of those laws that God had given. And so, in the book of Matthew, we have this chapter where Christ issues these woes to the scribes and Pharisees curses against them. And he says in one of them, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For while you offer a tithe of your mint and dill and cumin, you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness, and the love of God. But listen to what he says at the end, and this is what we often miss. You ought to have done the first... To give the tithe without neglecting the second. Mercy, love of God, faithfulness. We sometimes hear that verse and think he's saying all these things that they were doing, they were in the wrong. He was commending them on the one side for the external virtue, but criticizing them for their failure to go in to see that the reason they gave the tithe was not just a rule, 
but for them to develop their love and faithfulness to God and their mercy and love for those around them that were in need. Elsewhere, in the parable of the Pharisee and the publican, which we focused on two weeks ago, the man, the Pharisee, is not criticized and was not a sinner because he fasted twice a week and offered a tithe, but because of his self-righteousness, because of his judgmentalism towards the others that were there and puffing himself up in pride. Elsewhere in the Sermon on the Mount, Christ specifically tells us how we ought to offer a tithe in the almsgiving. Like with prayer, he does not say, if you pray, but when you pray, do this, this, and this. And so he says, when you give to the needy, first off, do not practice your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward in heaven. But instead, sounding no trumpet, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets, that they might be praised, you are to give in secret, not even letting your left hand know what the right is doing. And when you give in secret, the Lord will take that and glorify you in the last day, openly. So in one sense, then, we have been relieved of the rights of the law of the Old Testament because we are called to do something over and above what the Old Testament could have ever commanded. The Holy Fathers, like St. Irenaeus of Leon, tell us that just as Christ said, you have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, don't even have a lustful thought. You have heard it said, thou shalt not murder, but I say to you, don't even be angry with your brother. We now are called, because our eyes are set on the heavenly homeland, not simply on the blessings of this life, we are called, Christ says, to give to all who ask of us and are in need, to recognize that everything that we have is God's. Everything that we have belongs to him. But we need not be concerned in this, because in so doing, we will fulfill one of the commandments of Christ. What did he tell us in the Sermon on the Mount? He said, do not take any thought for your own life. What will I eat? What will I drink? What will I wear? Is your life not more than meat and drink and clothing? But instead, seek first the kingdom of God, and then all those things that are needed will be added to you. Think also of the church of the first generation that we hear told about in the book of Acts, how they sold all that they had and gave it to the apostles and shared it in common with one another. Or of the poor widow that Christ comments about in the Gospel of Mark when he saw her throwing just two small coins into the treasury at the temple in her offering. And all the pompous leaders were coming in and throwing in bags of money, clanging them against the ground and making sure everyone knew how much they were offering. But Christ, God himself, saw what that woman gave in secret and glorified her to his disciples and said, she has given all, more than all the rest because she gave everything that she had. And so, brothers and sisters, we are called upon then to give as a means of sacrifice to God and primarily as a means of working out our salvation. And so you might object to me though and say, Father, I'm not a monk, I can't live in poverty. True, you have a family, you have to take care of your family and that is part of the working out of your salvation. But remember, the act of giving alms is, a, is specifically a virtue that we are called upon as lay people to give. The monks have no property. They already share all things in common. And you could think of in the life of St. Anthony, St. Anthony the Great, that great father of the desert, he was one time told that there was a man living in the world who was in a state of holiness greater than his own. And so he went into the city. He was always looking for someone to teach him some virtue that he had not acquired himself which is a disposition we ought also to have, to always be seeking. He was described like a bee that buzzed around to every flower looking for some sweet thing that someone else could teach him. And so he ran to the city. He went to this man's house, and he began to question him. How do you live? What, what is your way of life? 
And he thought, I, I don't know, I'm, there's nothing great about me. But finally he said he was a doctor. And he lived off of just what he needed. And everything he else he didn't need, he gave to the church and to the poor. And then he sang, because he had that freedom from the concerns of this worldly wealth, he sang the holy, holy, holy with the angels continually. That was a great mark of his sanctity, and it's something that we could all embody in ourselves as well. You might also say, Father, I don't have tons of money to give. That's fine. God doesn't ask for tons of money. The poor, they're around. Take care of them in the way that you can. Notice what does Christ judge the people for? Not for giving money. He judges them for taking care of those that are in need. Those that are in prison, it doesn't cost anything to visit someone. Those that are sick at home or in the hospital, it doesn't cost anything to make a phone call to go and visit with them. That's an act of mercy. That's a way of giving alms as well. Those that need clothing, certainly we have extra sweatshirts and coats and pants and shirts around the house, I'm sure. Offer them to those that are in need. Those that are hungry, just welcome them in for a meal. You don't have to feed them for a year. Give them food. Give them drink. Those that are alone and lonely, give them love. You might also say to me, well, we have this need and we have that need. We have a car loan. We have kids to put through school. We have this, that, and the other. But one of the great blessings that comes from giving alms and from tithing is it begins to help us to really put into perspective what our needs and what our wants, especially when we're dealing with people who are living below poverty line, living on less than the necessities. Because you start to see, they get by with this, and here I think I need the newest iPhone, and a new car, and a new suit, and a new dress, and a new pair of shoes, and a new this, and a new that, and a television, and a cable package, and all these things. It really helps you to focus on what we truly need in life. And so if we would focus on these things, we'd begin to put aside all of these distractions that draw us away from God so that we can focus on God and on the love of our neighbor. Now you may also say, well, what can I do to help others? I'm not a doctor. I can't liberate people from prison. St. John Chrysostom points out to us that Christ doesn't ask anything extraordinary of us. You'll note when it comes to the prisoner, he doesn't say that you figure out legal fees to break them out or how to get them out of prison. He says, just visit them. Or you might say, I can't cure the sick. He doesn't ask you to cure the sick. He asks you just to be there, a hand of comfort on their shoulder as they go through difficult times. You may also ask, well, how do I know that the person that comes to me is truly in need and not just playing the system? Well, brothers and sisters, St. Paul tells us we would do better in our lives to be taken advantage of in an effort to actually offer love and charity to those around us than to always be seeking out to make sure that this is a true case. I'll tell you a story in the life of St. John the Merciful, the patriarch of Alexandria. He was called St. John the Merciful, the almsgiver, because of his great work in giving alms to the poor. And every day they would line up outside the church and he would be there to hand out food and clothing and money to those that are in need. And there was this man that kept going through the line and he'd walk up with a hat on one time and he'd take it off, he'd go back to the back of the line, he'd change his shirt and he'd come up again and take more from him. And finally his deacon said, Vedika, don't you realize this man's been through the line three times already? And he said, shh, how do you not know that he might be an angel that's here to test me today? to see if I will really fulfill Christ's commandment to give to him who asks of me. And so, brothers and sisters, we have this rich opportunity in almsgiving. I want to share one last story with you today. Because remember, what did Christ say? He doesn't simply say, come into my kingdom because you fed the poor and clothed the naked and were with the sick. But he says, in it, the fact that you did it to them... You did it to me. Well, in the book, The Prologue of Okrid, St. Nikolai Velimirovich records this beautiful account for us of a man that lived in Constantinople. And he prefaces this by saying first that 
in almsgiving and in Holy Communion, there are some similarities. In the Holy Communion, we receive the living Christ, the Lord himself, in the form of bread and wine. In almsgiving, we give to the living Christ, the Lord himself, in the form of the poor and the needy. And so he tells this story. There was a certain man in Constantinople who was very generous, always merciful. He would walk through the streets. He would press gifts into the hands of the poor and then hurry onward so that he didn't even hear their gratitude. He wanted his reward from God. One day someone asked him, we've seen you do this. Why are you so merciful to the people? And he said, one day I was in church and I heard the priest read the gospel and say that when we give to the poor, we give into the hands of Christ himself. And I didn't believe it. And so I thought, how can this be? Christ is in heaven. How can he be here present to receive in the person of the poor? But as I was going home that day, I saw a beggar sitting on the side of the road. And a man went up and gave to him a piece of bread. But above the beggar's head, I saw the face of Christ. And as the poor man reached out to receive the bread, I saw the hand of Christ receive the bread and then give a blessing to the man. And from that day forward, I have always striven to give to those that were in need, and I see the face of Christ shining in their faces. Wow. How beautiful. So, brothers and sisters, then, as we have heard this gospel today, as we are mindful of the judgment, let us do what we can in our time, in our place, to recognize that all good things that we have come from God and to give back to him as we can and to see the face of Christ in the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the needy, the poor, the sick, the imprisoned, all who are in need, to love and serve Christ in them so that on that great and fearful day, we may hear the good word that those on the right heard. Come, my faithful servants, into the kingdom that has been prepared for you. Come into the communion of the Father. Unite in this time that lies before us that threefold cord of your prayers, of the fasting that we will engage in in the coming weeks, and unite it and bind it together strongly with the virtue of almsgiving. Amen.